So tonight, inshallah, we're going to talk about Laylatul Isra al Mi'raj, the night journey and ascension of the Prophet Muhammad. And this is something that we should uh, reflect upon once a year. So we talked about this last year and the year before. Uh, so that's good because the Quran says reminders, benefits the believers. And that we should be growing spiritually every year. In fact, every month, in fact, every day. One of my teachers said that if I don't feel spiritually elevated from day to day, then I fail. So every day we should be increasing in our spirituality and in our knowledge, uh, sacred knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of our deen. Uh, so the Quran obviously is something that doesn't change in its love, in its text, the text of the Quran doesn't change. Uh, so that doesn't mean if you read the Quran once, then you're done. In some of our cultures, we celebrate when a child, for example, finishes, makes a khatam of the Quran, um, which for me is sort of mixed, I have mixed feelings about it. Because the children tend to think, well, I've done that, now it's time to move on. I made the khatam, it's over, they had a party, and goodbye. And, they never open the Quran again. Many of them are under that impression. So the Quran is something that we read all the time, right? Because we uh, increase in our spirituality. Um, we might read Yasin today and discover a nuance or a subtlety in its meanings that we didn't know yesterday. You can imagine when you read the Quran when you're 10 years old compared to when you're 50, it's almost a completely different book. Because the meanings of the Qur'an are infinite, the ma'ad of the Qur'an are infinite, the text never changes, and this is part of the miracle of the Qur'an, is that it's infinite in its meanings. Uh, so read a response, right? <clears throat> so, talking about the Isra, some of the Salaf say that it happened in the year 5 after the Bi'tha. What is the Bi'tha? Does anyone know? I'd like to be more interactive. Do you know? Al Bi'tha, what does it mean? If I say that the Isra is in the year five after Bi'tha, or if I say uh, eight before Hijrah, it's the same year. What is the Bi'tha? The Bi'tha is the commissioning of the Prophet ﷺ when he was 40 years old. His commissioning. Bi'tha literally means his raising. Right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned him when he was 40 years old, he was in Jabal al Nur, Ghar al Hira. He was in a cave called Hira on the Mountain of Light. And Jibreel alayhi salam came into the cave. This is called the Birtha. Other ulama, they say, um, and this is more dominant in its opinion, that it occurred in the year 10 after the Birtha, which is equivalent to, to the year 3 before the Hijrah. Right? And this is the opinion of most of the Tabirin. No Sahabi, as far as I know, mentions a year. As far as the month and the day, it's also not mentioned by the Salaf, but many later scholars they suggest different dates for Laylatul Isra. Some say 27th of Rabi al Awal. Uh, this is the opinion of Al Alusi and Suyuti and Nawawi. Other scholars, they say the 17th of Rabi al Awal. Some say the 29th of Ramadan. The dominant opinion is 27th Rajab. 27th Rajab, which is around today's date, uh, 10 after the Bi'tha. This is the dominant opinion as to when the Laylatul Isra and Mi'raj occurred. Um, the Jumhur of the ulama say that it happened after the Amr Huzun, the year of sadness. Does anyone know what happened during the year of sadness? Any of the Shabab? There was no Amr. Yeah, so Khadija al Kubra passed away. The Prophet's wife. And Abu Talib, his uncle that was the chief of the Bani Hashim, passed away. But also the Prophet Sallallahu he went to a place called Ta'if, right? Uh, to the Bani Thaqif uh, for da'wah. Uh, and he was stoned out of the city. He was stoned out of the city. They rejected him. They bruised and bloodied him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he uh, had a low point in his life, right? 
Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, in the ma'al usri yusra. In the ma'al usri yusra. And Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayah, may Allah preserve him, he just visited us recently. Uh, he commented on this verse and said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats ala usur with a definite article, which means that it, it, the second occurrence of ala usur is the same as the first, one difficulty. For in the ma'al usri yusra. For in the ma'al usri yusra. But yusra is repeated without a definite article. Meaning this is two different eases, like Yusrain. So with every difficulty, there are two eases. And this verse was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ as a consolation. So this was the day of Ta'if, was sort of the low point in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And it's interesting, when that happened, uh, there were some leaders of Quraysh, uh, the sons of Rabi'ah, who were in Ta'if at the time and had seen what had happened to the Prophet ﷺ, that he was stoned out of the city. So they sent him a Christian slave named Adas, who brought grapes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet asked him where he was from, and he said, I'm from Nineveh. And Nineveh is the city of who? Yunus Alayhi Wasallam. So it's very interesting, your ulama mentioned here, something beautiful. They say, look, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is reminding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here of Yunus Alayhi Wasallam. Yunus Alayhi Wasallam had a difficult time Fanada fi dhurumat. He was in dhurumat, in darknesses, in the plural. Right? He was in the belly of the al-hut, the fish of the whale, uh, in the ocean, in the darkness of the night. But then soon after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him victory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that over 100,000 people believed in his message after that. So after this so-called Yunus moment, there was a great victory for Yunus alayhi salam. A great victory. So this is the Yunus moment of the Prophet and he's collapsed under a tree in an orchard owned by Mushrikeen. His feet are soaked in his own blood. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a great victory. He gave him a gift. The gift is Laylatul Isra wa Mi'raj, the night journey and ascension. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him this gift? To give him tathbit in his qalb, to give him strength in his heart, the nubiya min ayatina. And as Allah says, in order for us to show him some of his signs, in order for us in the royal plural, Jem'ar Medaki, Nunu Ta'lim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a royal plural, in order for us to show him some of our signs. So this is uh, something that we have to believe in as Muslims. We believe in Laylatul Isra. The Isra is Dalil Qat'i, Qat'iyatul uh, Thubut. This is a definitive proof text that we believed that the Prophet ﷺ was taken in body Glory be to the one who took his servant on a journey by night from the inviolable mosque of Mecca to the furthest mosque, we'll talk about what that is, uh, in one night, Laylan. Right? So this is a clear, definitive proof text. Now, bits and pieces of the Isra in the Mi'raj are sprinkled across numerous ahadith. Many of these ahadith have weakness in them, so it presents a challenge when trying to piece together an authentic narrative or chronology. So there's a few hadith we're going to be looking at. The hadith in Sahih Muslim, which is related by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, and in Bukhari, Malik ibn Sa'asa, and Anas ibn Malik. First of all, linguistically, uh, you know, Lugatan, linguistically, what does Isra mean? Does anyone know? What does Isra mean? Yes, sir? Yes. Huh? No, no. No, that's not what it means. Isra. Does anyone know? Anybody else? Isra means a nocturnal journey, a journey by night, to go out on a journey at nighttime. Right? Isra. And the verbal form here is causative, asra, subhana ladi asra, right, causative, right, af'ala yuthrilu ifa'a. So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes someone to go on a nocturnal journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his abd, took his servant, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So isra is a nocturnal journey. Mi'raj is an ism a'la in Arabic, which is called a noun or instrument. Right, um, so you can translate mi'raj as a staircase or a ladder or something like that. The means by which one ascends. Ascension itself is called uruj. 
the Uruj of the Prophet So Isra and Mi'raj. In Bukhari, we are told that this journey began when the Prophet was in Al-Hatim. Al-Hatim is also called Hijr Ismail. So if you obviously you've seen the Kaaba or you've been to the Kaaba, there's a small semicircle, right, right adjacent to the Kaaba that we make tawaf around. That's called that's called the Hijr of Ismail or Al Hatim. There's another hadith in Muslim that says, Kuntu al Bayt, that I was at the Bayt, I was at the Baytullah, the Kaaba. Right? So you have two hadith here saying two different things. So um, according to the principles of hadith, right, usul of hadith, if you have two hadith that seem to contradict one another, you have to sort of try to make them work together, right? It's called that jama. So in reality, there's no contradiction here, right? And the bait and al hatim are the same thing because the hatim is at the house; it's at the Kaaba. Um, there's another hadith that says the Prophet sallallahu was in the house of Umhani when this began. Umhani, and in another hadith it says in the house of Abu Talib. In another hadith he says, Bain, "I was bain at ifnain; I was between two. So how do we make these hadith work? Who is Umhani? Does anyone know? Umhani? Nobody knows? The wife of Abu Talib. The wife of Abu Talib. Very good. The daughter of Abu Talib. The daughter of Abu Talib. All right? So one says, I was in the house of Umhani. Another says, in the house of Abu Talib. So there's no contradiction here. Right? It's the same house. In Bayna Ifnain, the Prophet ﷺ was sleeping between two men. So there's a room full of men that are sleeping. This is a very precarious time uh, for the Prophet ﷺ. If remember, when he returned from Ta'if, he could not go directly into Mecca immediately because Abu Talib had passed, and the chief of the Bani Hashim was Abu Lahab, and Abu Lahab did not offer his nephew any type of protection so they can kill him on sight. So the Prophet ﷺ, he sends a correspondence to Suhail ibn Amr, Right, for protection. In reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects his Nabi. Right? Allah protects you from the from human beings. Right? You are in our inaya, you're in our fortress, we are guarding you. That's in reality. Right? So the Prophet وسلم, he actually went back to Jabal al Nur and he wrote a correspondence to a man named Mut'im ibn Adi. And Mut'im and his sons, they offered to protect the Prophet. But still, it's very precarious. So he's sleeping in a room, there's other men in the room, a group of men, and he's between the ulama say, he's sleeping between Sayyidina Hamza and Sayyidina Ja'far. Now, how do we make these hadith work with the previous hadith, that he was in that bait, that he was at al hatim right? So Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, al-Hafiz, radiallahu anhu, he says, the journey initially began in the house of Umhani, right? In Jibreel alayhi salam, according to a hadith in Sahih Muslim, he came and he extracted the Prophet وسلم, from the house of Umhani through the roof and took him to the Hijr Ismail al Hatim. Right? So this is how he makes the hadith work. The Prophet وسلم, at this point, uh, his uh, blessed chest is split open and his heart is washed at least for the second time. Some say this happened three times. We know what happened when he was a child. And he says that a tasq min dhahab, a bowl made of gold, was used, uh, was filled with zamzam, and it was poured over his, his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa Some of the ulama say, uh, gold is problematic, we can't use gold utensils, so how does this hadith work? Well, one interpretation is that the prohibitions against gold utensils was not in place yet. Another interpretation, more spiritual, says that uh, these utensils came from Jannah. They're from paradise. So the fiqh of Jannah takes precedence here over the fiqh of dunya. Right? So in Jannah, you can wear silk, you can wear gold, you can drink wine. It doesn't intoxicate, right? These types of things. So this time, however, the, what's known as the Haqq al shaitan right? When the Prophet ﷺ was a very young boy, his chest was split open and a black clot was taken from his heart. Right? This clot is called Habd al-Shaytan. And there's different ways of understanding this. Habd al-Shaytan is a construct phrase. Right? It's called an idafa in Arabic, annexation. So how do we understand that? There's two ways to understand it. 
as either partitive annexation or possessive annexation. So partitive annexation means, if you can just bear with me with the, the grammatical terms here, uh, this is according to the Ejeromiya, which is a treatise of grammar that intermediate students of Arabic will study. Habb al-Shaytan will be um, uh, translated as Habbun mina shaytan a portion from the shaytan, a portion of something that originates from the shaytan. Right? So the ulama say that's not the correct understanding of the shaytan. The other way of looking at it is as possessive annexation with the particle or the preposition li. So haddun lish shaytan, a portion for the shaytan, meaning that this this had, this portion originates with the Prophet sallallahu but he intended to give it to the shaytan. Right? So you, you see the subtle difference between min and li, from and for. A portion that's from the shaytan, that originates from the shaytan, that was given to the Prophet sallallahu this is rejected by the ulama. Haddun lis shaytan, a portion of something that originates with him sallallahu that he intended to give to the shaytan. Right? So a portion of what? The ulama say a portion of mercy. That the Prophet sallallahu his heart is quite literally overflowing with mercy. There's too much mercy. You have to take some of it out. He would have shown some inclination of mercy towards even the shaytan sallallahu alayhi wa And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want him to do, to do that. So that was removed from his heart. So we remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking directly to him says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكِ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you except as a mercy, rahmatan. And this word is feminine, right? So the longer the word in Arabic, the, the more emphasis it has. So if you add a tamar buta, if you make it feminine, it has more emphasis, right? In another verse in the Quran, this is in Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 56. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the rahmat Allah qareebun min al muhsineen. Right? So if you look at that, if you study Arabic and you look at this verse immediately, you notice a grammatical issue here. Right? In the rahmat, what gender is rahmah? Does anyone know? Feminine, mu'annath. What gender is qareebun? Masculine. So you have a problem here. In this type of sentence, this is called a nominal sentence, where there's two parts, right? There's a mubtada in khabar, right? Subject and predicate. And according to Arabic rules of grammar, these two are supposed to match in their gender, right? If I say, arrajulu tawilun, that's a good sentence, the man is tall. If I say, arrajulu tawilatun, tawilatun, the predicate, that's uh, finishing the sentence here is now feminine, so now it becomes a problem. So what do the ulama say here? In the rahmat Allahi qareebu min al muhsineen They say the rahmah here is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So that's why qareeb is masculine. Indeed, the mercy of God is close to the doers of good. So these are subtleties in the Arabic that people tend to not even notice. That's why we should study some, some Arabic inshallah ta'ala. So at this point, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says that a dabba, which is some sort of animal, duna al bakhli wa fuq al himar abyad. He says an animal that's smaller than a mule, but bigger than a donkey, that's white, was brought to him, right? And this is called al buraq, al buraq. And there are later writers who say things like the buraq had the head of a woman and the tail of a peacock. Uh, and it had wings like a pegasus. None of these things are authentic. They're not found in Saud Hadith, right? It's, it was simply a small white horse. Uh, and of course, Burak, according to many ulama, grammarians, they say the root is Barq, which means lightning. So Burak can move like lightning. So the Prophet ﷺ said that Burak, it took his front hoof and it placed it on the horizon and it would move by folding up the earth. So very quickly, it can get around the world, basically. And in the hadith of Tirmidhi, when the Burak was brought to the Prophet it initially shied away from him. It was awestruck by the majestic appearance of the Prophet So he mounts the Burak and they speed northwards. Uh, and they land on the Temple Mount in Beitul Maqdis. They land in Jerusalem, Al-Quds. And the Prophet now this is interesting. This is called Masjid Al-Aqsa. Right? 
So if you look at the Temple Mount today, there's two structures on the Temple Mount, right? One of them is in the middle, almost directly in the middle. What's that called? Huh? Yeah. Dome of the Rock. Masjid Qubbat al-Sahra. The Dome of the Rock. It has the golden dome. Right? Then you go to the southern end of the platform, you find something else with the black dome. What is that called? Masjid al-Aqsa. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhanahu wa asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-Aqsa. Was that structure there at that time when this ayah was revealed? No, it wasn't there. No, neither of these two structures were there. They were built by the Bani Umayyah many, many decades after the passing of the Prophet In fact, some Western Orientalists, they'll actually say that this is proof that this ayah is much later. It's not even part of the Quran because there was no Masjid al-Aqsa at that time. But how do we understand it? So I think here that um, uh, Martin Lings makes a good point. He says that the Prophet ﷺ was taken to the site of the old temple. In fact, the entire temple mount is holy, according to Judaism. That entire platform, which has a surface area of something like 40 or 50 football fields, right, in the old city, that entire area is considered to be sacred. Right? And that probably the old temple of Solomon, where Esai and Salaam used to pray, was where the Dome of the Rock is now. Okay? So Masjid al-Aqsa, the farthest masjid, is simply a reference to that entire temple mount. Wallahu alam. So Prophet sallallahu he ties the burak and he prays rak'atain. And then he looked behind him and he said, I saw jami' al-anbiya. All of the prophets were behind me. And he led the prophets in prayer. He is Imam al mursaleen the Prophet ﷺ. He is the leader of all the messengers. And this is part of our aqidah. He's the best of creation. He's better than angels. He's better than the Kaaba. He's better than the Kursi. And he's better than the Arsh. He's better than Jibril. He's better than the Loh. He's better than the Qalam. Khayr al He's better than anything that's created. As Imam Ibrahim al aqami says, in the Johara at Tuhi. He says that, uh, that absolutely the best of creation is our prophet. So leave any type of dissent. Right? Some of the rationalists, they said that certain angels are better than certain prophets and things like that. Uh, but that's, not, that's going against the ijma' of the salaf. Right? The prophets are the best. They're better than angels. And the best of the prophets is the Prophet right? Like Imam al for example, who was a Mu'tazila, he said that uh, the Prophet وسلم, is the best prophet, he's the best of creation, but then Jibril is next, and then the rest of the uh, prophets. So he made a mistake there according to the Jumhur of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. Although Imam al tafsir, which is called Al Kashaf, is a beautiful, beautiful syntactical exegesis of the Quran. Um, so you'll find that in many libraries. Nonetheless, the Prophet and you know if you know is it all of the prophets, 124,000 additional weakness in that tradition? Is it only the messengers, 313 or so? Is there a difference between the two? Some say they're identical. Uh, did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala somehow resurrect all of the prophets? Was it the arwah? Was it the the, the souls or spirits of the prophets? Allahu Adam. We know that the Prophet ﷺ, he saw Musa salam three times in this one night in three different places. When was the first time he saw him? Hmm? Praying in his grave. So when the Prophet ﷺ was flying overhead on the Barak, over the Sinai Peninsula, he looked down and he saw a red dune that was glowing, and Musa salam was praying in his grave. Right? And you say, how can the Prophet ﷺ see that he's flying so quickly? It's because the Prophet ﷺ doesn't necessarily see with his eye. You know, he sees with his heart, ﷺ. He becomes aware of it. Uh, when was the second time he saw him? On the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, when he led all the Prophets in prayer, and then he sees him again in the Sixth Heaven. Right? Three times he saw Musa A.S. How did he see him? Allahu A'lam. According to a hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, the Prophet وسلم, he met Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa uh, and had a conversation with them about 
Asah, the day, the hour, and the Yom al Qiyamah. Okay, where did this conversation take place? On the Temple Mount, in the Sanawat. We don't know for certain, but most of the ulama say that this conversation happened on Laylatul Isra al Mi'raj. In another hadith of Jadr, the Prophet he describes the appearance of these three men. He says that Isa a.s. looked like Urwa ibn Mas'ud al Thaqafi. Who knows who, how Urwa looked like? We don't know what he looked like, right? But the Sahaba knew what he looked like. Right? But in another hadith, the Prophet is more specific about the appearance of Isa a.s. So he says he was a shorter man, stocky, a very fair complexion, and lank hair, like it was wet, right? So in ancient Israel, prophets used to consecrate kings by pouring oil on their heads, right? So Isa a.s. he's called al-Masih, and or Hamashiach in Hebrew, which means the one who is anointed, the one whose hair is oily, right, quite literally. Right? So in all of the visions of Isa a.s. of the Prophet Sallallahu he notices, he mentions that fact, that his hair looks like he just walked out of the bath. Right? His hair looks wet. Right? Uh, another opinion is that Isa a.s. is called al basir which means, you know, we make masha of our head, we make wudu, we rub over our heads, we anoint our heads. One opinion is that Isa a.s. He would simply pass his hand over infirmities, over a blind man's eyes. He just make mazha over his eyes, and he can see. Over his ears, and he can hear for a deaf man. Over skin that has leprosy. Just pass his hand over it. This is why he's called that Messiah. Allahu Akbar. And then he describes uh, Musa alayhi salam. He says, Musa alayhi salam looked like a man from the tribe of Shanua. And who knows how the men of Shanua looked? We don't know, but the Sahaba do. <laughs> but in another hadith, he describes in more detail. And he says, Musa a.s. was taller, he was lean, had darker skin, an olive complexion, and he had curly hair. That's Musa a.s. And then about Ibrahim a.s. He says, فَإِذَا أَقْرَبُوا مَنْ رَأَيْتُ بِهِ شَبَهًا صَحِبُكُمْ He says, the closest one in appearance to Ibrahim is your companion. Referring to himself. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he looked like Ibrahim alayhi salam. He had the closest resemblance to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he has this conversation, and Musa alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam, they have nothing to offer as far as the sa'a, or the day of judgment. But Isa alayhi salam, he says something interesting to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. He says, between now and the sa'a is my rujur. Between now and the hour is my second coming, my return. And Ibn Kathir says, that is, this tradition has reached Tawatur. It's multiple, multiply attested that Muslims believe in the second coming of Isa Isa, multiple attestation. This is called the Parousia in the New Testament in Greek, the second coming. And there's indications in the Quran, wa inna hu li ilmu li sa'ati, or as the ulama say, wa inna hu li sa'ati, that he is a sign of the sa'a, Isa Isa, in reference to Isa Isa. He is a sign of the hour. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, also says, that Isa salam will speak to the people as a child and as an old man. Right? Kahlan in Kuhuliya, according to Ibn Jawzi, does not begin until you're 35 years old. And Isa salam, according to dominant opinion, ascended. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up when he was either 31 or 33. So he's yet to speak to the people as an old man. So these are indications in the Quran. There's many, many hadith. Many hadith that are sound hadith in which the Prophet speaks of the second coming of Isa. He also tells the Prophet that he will kill the Dajjal. And Dajjal, the word Dajjal is actually Syriac, Mashiach Degala in Syriac, the language of Isa, which means Antichristos or false messiah. That Isa will kill the false messiah. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, I'm going to tell you something about the Dajjal that no other Prophet told their Ummah, إِنَّهُ أَعْوَرُ وَرَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَرُ The Dajjal has one eye, and your Lord is not one-eyed. He kafiran. That between his eyes, or on his forehead, is written kafara, kafara, or kafir, right, unbeliever. Every mu'min, whether they can read or not, will recognize that. Right, this is what he says in it. Hadith. And if you're 
familiar with popular culture, you'll see the one eye everywhere. If you watch American Idol, it's everywhere. If you, if you go to a concert, it's everywhere. If you watch a movie, you'll, you'll start noticing the one eye everywhere. It's on the back of the dollar bill. It's on the great seal of the United States, right? Novus Ordo Soclorum, the New World Order, and then you have the one eye. Right. And there's a hadith which is in Bayhaqi and Abu Dawood, the Prophet said that there will come a time when the Ummah, the nations, will invite each other to the killing of Muslims, like they're inviting each other to a banquet. Right? Why does he use food? He uses the analogy of ta'am, because food puts up no resistance. You can eat it, devour it, spit on it, step on it, throw it in the garbage. Right? So one of the Sahaba, you know, these are Arabs, right? So he said, إِذِن, We must be very few in number. And the Prophet said, كَثِيرٌ 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 You are many, many, many on that day, but you're like the scum on the ocean. <laughs> scum on the ocean, no depth, right? Superficial. One dimensional. There's no depth to them at that time. They're just worried about one thing. They got one eye. How do I make money or something? Right? Anyway, um, there is this organization called the, uh, we don't want to get political or anything, but uh, the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, right? They meet and they discuss foreign policy. Basically, they talk about how to colonize the Muslim world. Council of Foreign Relations is called CFR. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> CFR. Anyway, um, the Prophet Isa uh, he also says, he talks about Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Gog and Magog were mentioned in the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, as well as the book of Revelation. Uh, that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are going to run amok on the earth. They're going to consume the world's resources. And Isa will make dua against them and they will die. And then their carcasses will stink up the earth. And Isa will make another dua and floods will come and take them out to the oceans. Who are Gog and Magog? So most of the ulama say that these are the wild tribes of Central Asia. Ibn Kathir says that these are the Khazars. So Khazars, um, this is used to be the kingdom of Khazaria, which is in southern Russia between the Black and Caspian Sea, just north of the Caucasus. And they actually converted to Judaism, right? And many scholars actually believe that the Khazars are the progenitors, the ancestors of the Ashkenazim Jews, the European Jews, right? So uh, at the end of time, right, Isa is going to come into major conflict with Western Zionism. Western Zionism. It was Ashkenazim Jews that founded Israel, the state of Israel. Theodore Herzl, for example, an Ashkenazic Jew, right? Um, he convened the first Zionist con Congress in 1898. He wrote the book, The Jewish State, right? In fact, it, what's interesting is the vast, vast majority of Orthodox Jews uh, are totally against the legality of the state of Israel. Because for them, only the Messiah can set up the state, renew the state of Israel. To do it through political means is actually forbidden. So Isai is set up, then his end of time uh, conflict with Gog and Magog will have major, major issues with Zionist Jews as well as Evangelical Christians because the majority of Zionists are Evangelical Christians. Well, Allah, this is the opinion of Ibn Kathir, but I think he has something interesting to say about this. <clears throat> of course, the Christians think that we're God and God. <laughs> anyway, the Prophet said at this point he begins his ascension into the Samawat. And these are not the Jannat. This is different. These are not the paradises. These are the heavens. There's a difference between the two. Okay? He meets eight prophets in these seven heavens, these seven Samawat. Eight prophets. Why these eight prophets? You know, why didn't he meet Yaqub or Elias or Dawood or Suleiman? Why these eight prophets? The ulama say something beautiful. Here. They say because these eight prophets represent some type of Mohammedan typology. Some sort of, in other words, 
They're foreshadowing something that's going to happen in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, he meets Adam ﷺ in the first heaven, which is called as Sanaa dunya And the Sanaa dunya is our perceptible universe. The Sanaa dunya is the only Sama that has stars. Okay, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wazayyina as Sanaa dunya bimasabiha," that we decorated or ornamented the Sanaa dunya, the first Sama with stars, right? So all these images we're getting from the Hubble telescope of, I don't know, thousands of light years away, that's all from the first heaven, the first sama, a sama with dunya, okay, the first heaven. So the Prophet ﷺ actually said in a hadith that, uh, imagine a man dipping his finger into the ocean and extracting it. Compare the water on his finger with the water in the ocean. That's analogous to how much of the perceptible creation that we see with our eyes compared to what we don't see. The vast, vast, vast majority of creation is veiled from our eyes. We don't even, can't even imagine what's out there. Anyway, Adam alayhi salam, what happened to him? He was exiled from Jannah. He was exiled from the garden. This is an indication, this is a typology or foreshadowing that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam will be exiled from Mecca. Right? It's according to the ulama. In the second heaven, he meets Isa alayhi salam, Isa ibn Maryam, and Yahya ibn Zakaria. And these are the cousin prophets. And what happened to these two prophets? That their people were constantly trying to kill them. They were persecuted. In Isa alayhi salam, they attempted murder. The Quran says, they did not kill him nor crucify him, but it was made to appear so unto them. In fact, the name of Jesus in Syriac, Yeshua, literally means one who is saved by God. Saved by God. Right? And Yahya, right? His Hebrew name is Yohanan, but we call him Yahya. Yahya means what? Resurrected. Literally means Life. Alive. Life. Alive. Why is why is he called alive? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Don't say about those who are killed in the path of God that they are amwat, they're dead. They're alive. So Yahya is a martyr. Right? And according to the story in the New Testament, this is what it says in the Anajil al Arba, the four Christian Gospels, it says that Yahya was imprisoned by a man named Herod Antipas, who was kind of a puppet. You know, we have a lot of puppets. Nowadays, he was a puppet Jewish leader of Judea. He was a Roman puppet. And Herod Antipas, uh, he had his birthday celebration. So he wanted his own daughter to dance in front of all of the men, right? This is called a dead youth in Arabic. It's the worst thing you can call it in Arabic. It's a dead youth, which means a man who doesn't care about women, doesn't care who looks at his daughter, his wife. He's proud of it, right? Dead youth is also the word for pimp in Arabic. Right? So she refuses. And then he says, no, dance for us. It's my birthday. And she says, I'll dance on one condition. Bring me the head of Yahya Isa. So they bring the head and she dances. Right? Um, and the Prophet وسلم, 13 times assassination attempts were made on him. And Ibn Mas'ud actually says that uh, the Prophet وسلم, he died a shaheed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the honor of martyrdom, istishhad. Because he complained to Aisha on the day of his passing that I can still feel the tinge of the poison on my palate. Because years earlier, he was invited to the dwellings of the Bani Nadir. And a Jewess uh, lady, she put some poison into the shoulder of a lamb. And the Prophet ﷺ went there with his companion, Bishop. And Bishop ate and he died. And the Prophet ﷺ, he put the meat into his mouth and he said that this meat is telling me it's been poisoned. And he spit it out, but it, it caused some damage to his palate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a mu'jiza, extended his life many years so he can complete his risada. But it was a contributing factor to his death. So This is the opinion of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. <clears throat> Yusuf alayhi salam, he met in the third heaven. What happened to Yusuf alayhi salam? He was persecuted by his brothers, and then they came to him pledging allegiance. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he comes back into Mecca, what do they say? Ahun Karim, you know, generous brother. And the Prophet ﷺ, he climbs Abu Qubais, 
And what does he say to them? He quotes Yusuf, Yusuf alayhi salam from the Quran. La tafriba alaykum There's no blemish on you today. Allah has forgiven you. In the fourth heaven, Idris alayhi salam, there's not much that the Quran says about Idris alayhi salam. Mudhkur fi kitab Idris. إِنَّهُ كَانَ صِدِّقًا نَبِيًّا وَرَفَعَنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيًّا Remember Idris in the book, he was a truthful man and a prophet, and he was, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him to a high place. And this high place is the fourth sama. Right? And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise your remembrance. He raised your remembrance. According to the Jalalain of Suyuti, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Whenever I am mentioned, you are mentioned. Whenever I am mentioned, you are mentioned. Right? Fil adhan, fil iqama, fil khutbah. Right? Uh, uh, in the tashahud, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. This is one of the meanings of warafa'na laka dhikrak. Wallahu alam. Hassan ibn Thabit, he said, washaqa lahu min ismihi liyujim lahu fadhul arshi mahmoodun wa hadha muhammadu. He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took his name from one of his names for the for the possessor of the Arsh is Mahmud, a name of Allah, while this is Muhammad. In other words, they share an etymology. This is a way of eulogizing the Prophet ﷺ. In the fifth heaven, he meets Harun salam. According to the Torah, it was Harun that actually fashioned the Ijl, the, the golden calf. This is mustahil for a Prophet to do. In the Quran, it doesn't say Harun salam. it says as Right? This person called as Samiri. But Harun السلام, he was hated by his people and then he was loved. So the Prophet is, being, is going to be exiled, they're going to try to kill him, he's going to be hated by his people and then they're going to accept him and love him. Just like Harun In the sixth heaven he meets Musa السلام, and Musa السلام, the ulama say had a lot of difficulties with his people. And the Prophet السلام, will also have a lot of difficulties with his people. Something else they say here is that Musa السلام, received a sharia, right? And the Prophet السلام, will also receive a sharia. That there's a there's an affinity between the two prophets. And there's actually a prophecy in the Torah, in the fifth book called Devarim, that a prophet will come who's similar to Moses, right? And he'll be given sharia. And that's why Waraka bin Nofal, after the birthah of the Prophet السلام, he said, uh, there has come unto you the great sharia. Namus is from the Greek nomos, which means sharia, law. There has come unto you the great law, just as it came to Musa alayhi And in the Quran also, inna arsadna ilaykum rasulan shahidan ilaykum kama shahidan alaykum kama arsadna ila fir'awna rasula kama. We sent unto you a, a messenger to be a witness against you, just as we had sent a messenger to Fir'aun, meaning Musa And there's other indications as well. In the seventh heaven, the Prophet وسلم, he meets Ibrahim السلام, and the ulama say here, it's an indication that the Prophet وسلم, will inherit the rights of the Hajj. In the seventh heaven, the Prophet وسلم, he also saw various ayat, ayatul kubra, وَلَقَدْ رَآ مِنْ آيَاتِهِ الْكُبْرَى He saw great signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the seventh heaven. He saw the Baytul Ma'mur. The Baytul Ma'mur is the celestial Kaaba. Baytul Atik is also called. So if you're standing at the Kaaba and look directly up into the sky, in the seventh heaven directly above the Kaaba is the celestial Kaaba called Baytul Ma'mur. The ulama say if the Baytul Ma'mur fell from the sky, it would crush the earthly Kaaba. It's directly above it. It's much, much bigger. 70,000 angels enter into Baytul Ma'mur, according to the Prophet Wasallam. Every day, 70,000 angels go in and no one sees them come out. And according to the Hadith, Ibrahim السلام, was leaning on the Baytul Ma'mur when the Prophet Wasallam entered into the seventh Sama, the seventh heaven. He also saw uh, the Jannat, the gardens, all seven gardens are in the seventh heaven. The Jannat, right? He also saw the 
Uh, and he saw, um, he was in one of the gardens, and he was walking, and he saw this huge palace. And he said to Jibreel alayhi salam, whose palace is this? And Jibreel alayhi salam said, uh, a youth from the Quraysh. And he said, who? He said, Umar. And as he was walking to get a closer look, a woman crossed, passed by him, and it was the mother of Anas, Umm Sulaim. Right? And then he heard the footsteps of Bilal ibn Rabah. Right? So, you know, we talk about Ashra Mubashirin al Jannah. The Prophet وسلم, told 10 men, guaranteed they're going to Jannah. But there's many other people he told they're going to Jannah, including many, many women. Okay? But these 10 is found in a hadith that is considered Mutawatir. It's a multiply tested hadith. The other hadith are considered Khabar Ahad, singular attestation, but they're still strong and sound hadith. Right? <clears throat> and then he saw Jibreel alayhi salam, Jibreel alayhi salam in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him with 600 wings in the seventh heaven, just as he had seen them before on Laylatul Qadr, the first revelation at the Bi'atha. And then he saw something called as Sidratul Muntaha which is translated the low tree of the furthest region, the low tree. The ulama say this is the end of the seventh heaven. Imam an nawawi says that some of the ulama say the trunk of the sitra is in the sixth heaven and then the branches extend into the seventh heaven. Wallahu alam. Some hadith regarding the sitra, which is in Muslim and Bukhari, um, the, tr the fruits of the sitra are like the jars of the people of Hajjah. The jars of the people of Hajjah. Again, what did they, what did they look like? We don't know. The Sahaba knew. But the Arana say here that the people of Hajjah, they had these huge jars, about six feet high. So huge fruits. And then he says that the leaves of the Sidrat al Muntaha were like Adhan or Fiala. They were like the, uh, the ears of elephants. And there's no indication that the Prophet ever saw an elephant. Right? Um, but this is something he's divining through revelation. The first time elephants were brought into Medina was at the time of Imam Malik ibn Anas. When the Muslims had conquered some lands and some elephants had come into the city, and Imam Malik was sitting in the Masjid of Nabawi, he was teaching hadith, and the elephants came into the city, and all of his students ran outside to look at the elephants except one man, Yahya bin Yahya. And Imam Malik said to him, why don't you go look at the elephants? And he said, Majid to the ajid I do not come for the sake of elephants. I came to learn. <laughs> I come to learn not to look at elephants. Um, so then, he also says that the Sidra has these alwan, these colors. It's enshrouded and enveloped by these colors. And these colors, they roll over the leaves of the Sidra, changing colors. It's dynamic. If yaksha Sidra tama yaksha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the low tree was enshrouded with whatever it was enshrouded. Some of the ulama here, they say, this is an indication of these colors that the Prophet described. La adri mahiya. I don't even know what these colors are. They're not on the spectrum. These are colors that he'd never seen before. Sallallahu alayhi wa And then he says, Firashun min dahab. There's these uh, butterflies, uh, maybe even angels of gold that are enshrouding the sidra. And then he says there are four rivers at its base, Nahrani Baltinani, two hidden rivers, Al Kautha and As Salsabil, and Nahrani Dahirani, two rivers that are apparent, which is the Nil and the Furat, the Nile and the Euphrates. Now you say, well, the Nile and the Euphrates are on Earth, right? The Nile is in Egypt, Euphrates in Iraq. So how how is it that the base of these two rivers is at the Sidrat al Muntaha? Allahu Alam. We don't know a lot more. In fact, this actually confirms something in the Torah, Genesis chapter 2. For your information, it says that Gan Adin, which Jannatu Adin, the Garden of Eternity, uh, flow, flowing out of Eden, that has Arba Aroshim in Hebrew, has four river heads. Right? There are four river heads coming out of the Garden of Eden, according to Genesis chapter 2, which is in the Torah. And then Jibreel alayhi salam, he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, taqaddam ya Muhammad, you have to go forward. And Jibreel alayhi salam cannot go forward. Beyond the Sidrat al-Muntaha, beyond the seventh heaven, he says that, you know, if I went beyond this point, I would combust into flames. So Jibreel alayhi salam does not have the maqam. 
doesn't have the station to go beyond the Siddharth of Muntah, only the Prophet was Khayr al Khalqillah. Right? And the ulama say that the Prophet you know, he kept his sandals on when he went beyond the Siddharth of Muntah. He didn't take them off. One of the reasons why is the sandal would combust. The only reason that it didn't is because it's attached to his foot. Right? So the ulama say here is a great lesson. If you have strong attachment, ittisal, strong attachment to the Prophet you won't combust into flames. You won't go to Jahannam, inshallah ta'ala. Right? A strong uh, attachment to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he heard the scratching of the pen. According to a strong hadith, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was al-qalam, the pen. And then Allah said, uqtu, write all of the history, all of the history of human existence, all of the history of, of creation, meta-history. So the Prophet ﷺ, he heard the scratching of the pen. So he came into the presence of Al-Qalam and Al-Arsh, the Arsh, which most scholars, they don't translate because uh, when we translate words like Arsh, they seem to conjure up anthropomorphic images in our head. Arsh, like footstool or throne or something like that. Right? The Arsh is a huge celestial creation that was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the base of this Arsh, at this maqam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks to His Habib وسلم, directly. He speaks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He experiences what's known as a ruqya, which is translated, as the Catholics call it the beatific vision, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Mustadrak of al Hadramain, the Prophet said, And Ibn Abbas, Ra'aytu Rabbi Azzawajal, I saw my Lord. So he didn't see him with the Ain al Fani, with the eye that perishes, but with the Ain al Baqi, the perpetual eye. What is that? Bila Kayfiya. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. There's no modality, there's no way to describe it. Right? But it's a reality. Al Ru'yatu Haqqun bi Ahlil Jannah. Imam al Tahawi says, that the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a reality for the people of paradise. You say, how? Kayf, bila kayfiya. There's no modality. You can't even begin to imagine it. So why even bother trying to explain it? Even Jannah, which is a created place. The Quran says you can never even imagine Jannah, which is a created place. Right? So seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually haram to try to envision intellectually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's beyond our comprehension, but it's a reality. And there's indications in the Quran. That you desire the fleeting, immediate gratification, and you procrastinate the afterlife, but on that day, faces will be beaming, gazing at their Lord. Gazing at their Lord. Gazing at their Lord. Right? In Surah Yunus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً In Imam Ghazali, his exegesis on this, for those who do good are good things and a little addition, another addition. And the addition here, according to Imam Ghazali, is a ru'ya, the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salam asked to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it wasn't possible, he wouldn't ask, because that would be bad adab. Right? So it's, a poss- it's possible to do that. Wallahu <laughs> ta'ala <laughs> alam. So, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Najm that at this point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed His servant whatever He revealed. مَا أَوْحَى It's left ambiguous. So the ulama say, these are asrar bain Allah wa habibi. That these are secrets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his habib, to his beloved, that we don't know. But there are three things that were revealed that we do know, at least, according to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. At this point, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given, was given a salah, the prayer. The prayer is now fall for him and his ummah. This is one of the three things that were given. The prayer is now obligatory for his ummah. The second thing that was given, Khawatim al-Baqarah. Khawatim al-Baqarah. The last two verses of Surah al-Baqarah. Amana Rasulullah bin Abu 
until the end of the surah. These two verses were placed directly into the heart of the Prophet ﷺ without Jibreel ﷺ as a means, because Jibreel ﷺ is not in this maqam. It's only Allah. There's no living creature beyond the Sidrat al-Muntaha except the Prophet ﷺ. Right? This is a place. The base of the Arsh is a place, which means that Allah is not in this place. There's some people who think, you know, you climb high enough, you get to Allah, because he's in a makan, he's in a place. No, Allah mawjudun bila makan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists without place. Where was he before he created place? Right? Space, time, materiality, were all created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Therefore, he's necessarily transcendent of these things. Right? So for those who say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a physical body, he's sitting on a throne, that means Allah dwells in his creation because the arsh is created by Allah. The seventh heaven is created by Allah. What's the difference between that and what Christians say about Isa alayhi salam? No different in my mind. Allah dwells in his creation. Right? So you have to be very, very careful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah who can, qabla al-makan. Wa huwa al-an ala ma alayhi kan. Imam Ali said, Allah is, Allah is without any type of place, and He is now exactly as He is. Right? Allah transcends makan and saman, you know, jihad, direction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not facing any direction, He's not moving, He's not still, He's not any color, He's not above anything physically or below anything physically. This is beyond our comprehension because our only frames of reference are this world. We live in time, we're material beings, we can't think outside of that box, right? But, there's nothing like the likes of God whatsoever, whatsoever. <clears throat> so then, the third thing is that the promise of Jannah, the wa'ad of Jannah to the Mu'mineen. So three things given to the Prophet in this intimate, mystical conversation he has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beyond the Siddharat al muntaha at the base of the Arsh, in the presence of the Qalam, that the prayer was made fault. The last two verses of Baqarah were put into his heart. And he's giving a wa'ad, a promise, that his ummah will go to Jannah, will go to paradise. When he descends, he passes the seventh heaven. Musa alayhi salam says, Bima umirta. What were you commanded? Why is Musa alayhi salam saying this? Because the ulama say, Musa alayhi salam has experience. Right? That he was called, now he's going back, because Musa alayhi salam was also called uh, at a smaller scale. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was called beyond the seventh heaven. Musa alayhi salam was called to Mount Sinai. Musa alayhi salam he was given 40 nights. Musa We appointed 40 nights for Musa. The Prophet ﷺ was given one night. Subhanahu one night. Musa ﷺ, he was called to a shajra, a small tree. It's called the burning bush. Right? The Prophet ﷺ was called to another shajra, a sidratul muntaha, the low tree of the outermost region. And some of the ulama also say, Musa alayhi salam, you know, Allah told him, ikhla'an alayk, take off your sandals. Whereas the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he said, keep your sandals on. And other differences uh, as well. There's a book by Imam Izzuddin ibn Abi salam, which is called, Bidayat um, al-Sul fi Tafdeel al-Rasul, the beginning of the inquiry into the eminence of the Prophet. He compares the Prophets. And he says something interesting. He says, Musa alayhi salam was commanded to strike a rock, a stone, with his staff. And when he did that, 12 springs gushed. This is a miracle, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, his miracle is akbar and adhar. It's greater and more apparent. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam did not have to strike a rock. He pointed to a rock in the sky called al-qamar, the moon, shaq al-qamar. And he split the moon, right? Just by pointing to it. So he says, what did your Lord command you? And he says, 50 prayers for me and my ummah. Right? And Musa says, Go back to your Lord and ask for uh, a, a discount, so to speak. 
a lessening, right? So the Prophet وسلم, did he go back beyond the or did he do it in dua? Allahu Alam. But there's a hadith in Ahmad where he, when Musa السلام, said that, the Prophet وسلم, he looked at Jibreel السلام, as, as if he was waiting for Jibreel to give him permission for some sort of ishara, some indication, which is a hadith that some of the ulama use uh, to encourage people to get a second opinion. Right? Doctor tells you something. Get a second opinion. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he when Musa and Musa alayhi salam said, "Ilji ala Rabbik," he looked at Jibril alayhi salam, and Jibril alayhi salam gave him the thumbs up, as it were. So it goes to forty-five, it goes to forty, it goes to thirty-five, and then it goes to five. And Musa alayhi salam says, "Ilji ala Rabbik, wasalu tachib." Go back to your Lord and ask for a lessening. It's too much. Because Musa alayhi salam said, "I have experience." With in Ummah, and that's too much for them. <laughs> so the Prophet وسلم, says, Sa'altu Rabbi hatta istahyayt. I've asked my Lord and I've become embarrassed. <laughs> so that's it. It's going to be five. And then it says, Nada munadin. A voice was suddenly heard. Ambaytu faridati wa khaffaftu an ibadi. I have determined my of obligations, and I have reduced the burden of my servants. It is five, but the reward is fifty. It is five, but the reward is fifty. And this again, it speaks to the importance of salah. There's a hadith of the Prophet where he says the difference, the fark, bain al mu'min wa kafir, the difference between the believer and the non believer is the prayer. And Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he took this as an essential difference. Meaning that if a Muslim is not praying, he's left Islam. He's become a Kafir. This is the opinion of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. That's why according to the Hanbali school, if you're a Muslim that didn't pray until you're 20 years old, you don't have to make up five years of prayer because you were a Kafir. Right? Uh, but the other Imams, they say, no, it's a qualitative difference. That if you're leaving the prayer, you're imitating the attributes of the Kafar. And this is a dominant opinion. But that opinion is out there. That if we left the prayer, we left Islam, which is scary. So we have to really make sure. I mean, if we're not implementing prayer, we're in big trouble, to be honest with you. We're in big, big trouble if we're not praying, right? So inshallah ta'ala, inshallah people are, are doing their salawat on a daily basis, trying to do it on time. Nothing is more important in your life. If you have to watch a movie, Godzilla 3D IMAX, that starts at 8 o'clock, um, but your Maghrib Salah is at 8.30, guess what? You can't watch the movie. Or you have to leave. Go in the hallway and pray. I've done that before. You know? And I don't advise doing that because, you know, especially on Memorial Day. <laughs> a Muslim on Memorial Day? Can't believe it. So you have to use your judgment. Don't put yourself in harm's way. But you should not, you have to, you have to plan your day around your prayer. That's the mo everything circulates around your prayer. Because what does your prayer circulate around, as it were, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? So you don't say, well, if I'm not doing anything, I guess I'll pray. No, no, no. Your prayer takes the uh, priority. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he goes back to Mecca. And he tells Umhani that he was in Jerusalem the night before. And Umhani is begging and pleading with him not to tell anyone. The Prophet says, Wallahi, I'm going to go now and tell them. He goes to the Hijr of Ismail and he tells them, he tells the Quraysh, and they're literally falling over themselves laughing at him. And many Muslims actually apostated because of this. Why? Because they judge Allah's power against their own intellects. Right? In other words, if it doesn't make sense to me, then it can't make sense to God. If it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't make sense to God. And it's false, right? The birth of Isa is something we believe in. It doesn't make sense to us, but it's mumkin, it's possible, it's conceivable within the realm of the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the omnipotence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to create a human being without any male intervention. And this is part of our belief. Ibn Qayyim said, the root of all fitna is when we subjugate revelation to our intellects. We subjugate revelation to our intellects. 
Why? Because the Akal has a cure as a very clear jurisdiction. There are certain things that the Akal simply cannot understand. We have to admit that. Uh, so we believe in what's known as Khawarik al Adat of the Hukum Adi. You know, that the, there's miracles, there's breaks in natural law. It's part of our aqidah. We believe in Sami'iyat, supra rational transmissions. Sami'iyat mutafayyabat, they're also called. Supra rational, not irrational. What's the difference? What's a supra rational transmission? Something that transcends the aql and is affirmed in sacred text, unfalsifiable textual traditions. Unfalsifiable textual traditions transcends the aql and is affirmed in sacred texts, like the Isra of the Prophet. Dalil Qat'i, we have to believe it as Muslims. Even if it doesn't make sense to your aql, it transcends your aql. It's way, it's well within the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that. Right? So we believe in it. Go back two hundred years in the time machine and tell somebody, you know, I'm gonna pick up a device in two hundred years and I can call my cousin in China. They'll say that's a miracle. The aql isn't there at that time, right? But it's possible, and now we see it. And now we say, so what? It, it's clear science. We can explain it very easily. But how do you explain it to people back then? What is an irrational transmission? Something that transgresses the aql and is repudiated in sacred text. In other words, it's falsifiable. You don't have to believe in anything that's falsifiable as a Muslim. If somebody tells you, you have to believe as a Muslim that the world is flat, you don't have to believe in that. Because you can demonstrate that as false. And this is why we get into danger when it comes to literalism. There's a hadith that says, in the last third of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the sama' wa dunya and answers his supplicants. And there's some people who take these things very literally. Right? Because there's aql and naql. Right? Aql means in intellect, naql means revelation. So you have people that are knuckleheads, as Shaykh Hamza calls them. The knuckleheads. Right? Who don't use the aql. They say, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, quite literally, as a physical body, he descends into the sana'u dunya in the last third of the night. But Akhil tells you that it's always the last third of the night somewhere in the world, isn't it? According to time zones, it's always the last third of the night. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forever stuck in the sana'u dunya below his arsh and his angels? No. So what does that mean? So we can't take a haqiqi, this cannot be literal, this is majaz, this is figurative. What does it mean? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy descends to the sanat, okay, his mercy, not himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we have to use our intellect. So something like the incarnation, like Christians believe in hulul, right? It's called hulul, tajassu, tajseem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he became a human being. It's called incarnation. Right? And the Christian will say to the Muslim, can't God do whatever he wants? And the Muslim say, yeah, God can do whatever. So can God become a man? And the Muslim say, well, I, 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 I guess so. <laughs> but here's the thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do whatever is possible. Allah cannot do the impossible, and it's not a limit on, on his power. There are certain things that are simply against the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That doesn't mean that he has weakness. Can a man give birth to a child? You can't do that, oh, you're weak. No, it's against the nature. Right? If, if Stephen Hawking came in, you know, Stephen Hawking is probably the smartest man, don't you know sense, right? And I asked Stephen Hawking, can you draw a four-sided triangle? So, no, I can't do it. Oh, you're not the smartest man. It's impossible to do that. Triangle by its nature has three sides, right? So a human being naturally needs things. I need something, I need oxygen. Without it, I'm dead. If I don't wear clothes, and I go stand outside on a hill, I'm going to die from the elements. If I stop eating or drinking, I'm going to die. If, you know, the, the, the earth kind of tilted a little bit, we all die. If the sun burned out, we're dead. If the moon goes away, we're dead. We're dependent on so many things, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not dependent on anything. كُلُّ شَيْءٍ يَحْتَاجُ يَحْتَاجُ إِلَيْهِ وَهُوَ لَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَى الشَّيْءٍ Everything needs him and nothing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need anything. So ironically, when, if we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes a human being, the truth is, that's limiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a limit on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Muslim belief does not limit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway. So, the mushrikeen, we're running out of time here. The mushrikeen, they went to Abu Bakr Siddiq, and they said, you know what your friend is saying now? You know, and interesting, one time I quoted a hadith 
in the masjid in the khutbah, it was the hadith of uh, the lizard. The lizard was making tasbih. The lizard said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. A lizard. It's a hadith. There's some weakness in the hadith. And the brother came up to me and said, Why do you say these things in the khutbah? These things are ridiculous. And, and so on and so forth. And, you know. And I said, Did you know that there's a hadith that a, a tree was crying? The Prophet said, you know, used to lean on a tree and give khutbah, and then they built the masjid. And then the Sahaba said that we can hear the tree crying. It sounded like a she camel giving birth. Ah, ah, like this loud, like this. And this is tawat, this is mutawat al hadith, multiply attested hadith. Right? So, yeah, these things are, yeah, why do you mention these things? And I said, in qalahu faqat sadaq. If he said it, it's true. Who said that? Abu Bakr Siddiq. Mushrikeen came to him. Do you know what he's saying now? He was in Jerusalem. The Prophet وسلم, he didn't mention the Mi'raj immediately. He just mentioned the Isra. Right? And Abu Bakr Siddiq said, if he said that, then it's true. In the hadith of Bukhari, لَمَّا كَذَّبَنِي قُرَيْشٌ قُمْتُ فِي الْحِجَرِ فَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِي بَيْتَ الْمَقْلِسِ So he says that when Quraysh disbelieved me, uh, I stood up in the Hijr of Ismail, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested a vision of Bayt al -Maqdus. I think we have to stop, inshallah, by giving the adhan. This will pray. They're annihilated with God's love, and they say things that are incorrect because they're in a certain state. Right? So they're like men intoxicated. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, we'll stop there, inshallah. Any... Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Um, something that I had come to find. First of all, it was a wonderful evening to spend listening to you and learning so much. Nice to see you. Um, one thing I had mentioned to you earlier, I'd like to share with everyone. Yes, okay. of course. Thank you. Um, because you had mentioned that Barak also means lightning. Yes. And what we now know is in the past, people took everything on faith. But because lightning, or the Barak, traveled at the speed of light, you ask even the kids today, they know, when something travels at the speed of light, time stands still. So whatever length of time the Prophet took to go to Jerusalem and to all the heavens and come back and so on, for him, it, the time just stretched out because he was traveling at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And the reason I mention this is so important is because so many of the young people are so overwhelmed by science and they see science versus religion. Yes. This is how it's projected in the schools, even though we know in Islam, science is really a way of kind of understanding what Allah created. Mm -hmm. um, but I yes. think this is important, for, especially for the children and mothers to understand to explain to their kids when they come home from school. Yes. That so time stood still, the prophet. Yes. All the time you need it. Mashallah. That's true. Here's a, there are um, fighter pilots who go up in these F 16s, and uh, they actually documented this when they hit you know, Mach 2, Mach 3, that they actually notice that their clocks will slow down even at that speed. So imagine if you're traveling, like you said, close to the speed of light. Um, then when you come back to Earth, you haven't aged as much as everyone else has. <laughs> Theoretically. So it's documentary on the History Channel. What's the what's the closest star system? What is that called? Alpha Centauri, right? He said so there was a scholar who said if we can build a spacecraft that can travel the speed of light, can go to Alpha Centauri, you can take a two-week vacation there, come back. It's been a month for you, but ten years for people on Earth. Theoretically possible. Of course, you can never build a spacecraft that fast unless Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala wills it to happen. But the Borak is really moving. Like that. Yes, sir. Um, so, um, I mean, uh, uh, of what I have heard is, I, I don't know how far it is true, but that the Dome of Rock is the, the place from where <coughs> Prophet Muhammad <coughs> ascended to the, to the heavens, yeah. right, on, on Miraj. So, um, it is also said, um, and I want to, like, get a verification how far that is true 
that the rock also started moving when Prophet Muhammad ascended and Prophet Muhammad said, you stay here. And the, the rock has moved and uh, it, um, it is like a little bit, I mean, kind of, you know, um, suspended in the, um, is that something true or that is just like a uh, kind of a story or something like that? It doesn't that? seem to be authentic. Right. I've heard this many times. It, it mm -hmm. seems like this comes from later sort of traditions from poets. Okay. That the rock began to rise and then he, he actually made it go back down. Allah mm -hmm. I don't think there's authentic tra traditions that mention that. Right. Okay. Allah Yes, sir. Um, you were saying earlier that at the end of creation, Jibreel said, I can't go any further because I've come back to the place. Uh -huh. um, me and several other people that we went to class today, they got taught that Jibreel actually tried going up and then his wings started to burn. So would that go against the belief that angels only do what Allah tells them to do and do that would be just what they know? Yeah, even this tradition of Jibreel alayhi salam combusting, there is weakness in this tradition as well. Uh, but that's true, the angels don't have free will like human beings. So Jibreel alayhi salam, you know, because he's the so-called host of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam during this journey, what, it's conceivable that he would try to go beyond, not beyond creation, beyond the Siddhas and Muntaha, because beyond the Siddhas and Muntaha is the Arsh and the Qalam, and th that's all created, right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he never left creation, he is created. Right? So, a created entity cannot leave creation, just as the Creator cannot enter into creation. These are mustahil. This is inconceivable for that to happen. Right? But that was the place where no... So, somebody would say, who's writing? You know, the pen is scratching. Who's the writer? There's no writer. The pen is scratching. Because Allah said, Bukhtu, write. Right? So, this is all in, in created reality. Jannah is a created place. The Arsh, the Kursi, all these things are created. The only thing that not created is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his actions and attributes. Right? He's al khaliq Everything else is makhluqat. And the nature of makhluqat is that it changed, tahweel. Anything that changes is created. That's how you can tell if something is creator or created. So, so automatically, if anyone comes out and says, I'm God, just by him saying that, he's invalidated, disqualified as being God. Because human beings are changing. You can't see me now, but I'm actually changing. I'm aging before your eyes right now. It's very subtle, it's very slow. My beard is getting longer. You can't see it, but it's happening. We're all changing. Everything's in a state of flux, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He is not in creation. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has pre eternality and He has post eternality. It's beginning. He's the first without a beginning, the last without an end. This is impossible for us to conceive because we're human beings and we live in a linear world once upon a time and then we live happily ever after. That's how we think. That's how the Bible is written. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. And then you have the book of Revelation and they lived happily ever after. Right? The Quran, however, is not linear. It's circular because Allah is the author of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say, you know, first Allah created Adam and then he goes through the prophets chronologically. He doesn't do that. He says, Musa alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, back to Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam. And why is he going back and forth? Because the Quran is circular in its themes, which indicates that its author is not a human being. That's why initially the Western Orientalist, when he sees the Quran, he thinks this is all jumbled, it's out of order, what's, what's going on here? He doesn't understand that this is not written by a human being. You have to think outside the box when you read the Quran. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the Yom al Qiyamah, He will give human beings a quality of baqa, of perpetuity, as a gift. So when we go to Jannah, inshallah, we will never die. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this quality of baqa, perpetuity, that He has naturally, that He has inherently. We've given to us and the people of Jahannam Khalidan <laughs> Fiha forever and ever, as the Quran says. Right? And Allah doesn't break his promise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not say in the Yom Qiyamah, I know I said this in my Quran, but I'm going to break my promise and destroy creation 
and have no Jannah. Because why? Well, Because Allah Himself says my promise is true. Allah Himself says it. Right? So when it comes to a, a wad on the believers, a promise on the believers, Allah will always fulfill His promise. If Allah makes a promise to you, you can, as it were, take it to the bank and cash it. It's always going to come true. But a wa'id, a threat on the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forego that threat out of His mercy. He may forego his wa'id, his threat. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, and this is not him being, you know, um, uh, showing any type of infidelity or anything like that. So the ulama use an example. Imagine a king has a kingdom, and he has a, he has a law in the kingdom. And the law says, anyone who is caught poaching sheep is going to be killed. So a young boy is caught poaching sheep. He's brought to the king. And the king says to him, you know what the penalty is for poaching? Execution. And the boy says, but I only did it because my family is starving. And the king says, okay, go away and take the sheep with you. That's from the magnanimous nature of the king to forego his threat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could conceivably forego all the threats and enter all of us into Jannah without any type of reckoning, no punishment in the grave. But that's what we hope for. We don't depend on it. We don't lean on it because Allah doesn't have to do that. Allah can take out his threat on whoever he wants. Right? That's why we have to be between hope and faith. And pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgoes his threats on us. Because he'll never forgo his promise. Yes, sir. Today, the science and technology has so advanced that there are determining and finding so many things which has you have been told 1400 years ago when uh, in when the dina ya quluna rabbana habluna wa tilka aya that say we have to focus on the fact that the samawat and the earth rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batil subhanaka faqad ajabna the muslims who determine and find things invention this they submit to allah taala and make sure of it but in this country, the scientists did it, did it, did it. Yes. How, yeah. how, that in, how that in the comparison of these two separate things? Yeah, it's incredible. Imam Ghazali mentions uh, in Athar, there's some weakness in it, but he mentions that the majority of the people in paradise are simple, simple people. Simple people. Right? So, you know, it's in Jahannam where you find, you know, Doctor this and doctor that and doctor this and doctor that and you know people who worship their aqal their aqal. Because it's dangerous. The aqal can actually hinder your tasleem to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's so much pride in our intellect. Right? It's very interesting, you know. People who say, you know, they can date the universe to four decimal places. Lawrence Krauss, he's a foremost cosmologist, <clears throat> professor, atheist, and he says that he can date the universe to four decimal places, 13.7256 billion years. That's when the point of singularity exploded, right? So you ask him, you know, then how, where did the point of singularity come from? He says, well, we don't know yet. <laughs> or some say it, can, it came from nowhere. It comes from nothing, which is a big leap of faith. If you can believe something comes from nothing, then you can believe anything. Something coming from nothing, you know? So I use the analogy with my students. Say, so let's say I took off my hat, I pulled a rabbit out of my hat. Right? That's something from something. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He is Al Bari wa Musawwir. He is the one who creates from existing matter and then shapes it, as it were, going from some creation to another creation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also Badi or Samawati wa the one who creates min adam ex nihilo, out of nothing. He creates something out of nothing, right? So to believe that a universe comes from nothing is a big leap of faith. In other words, what I'm trying to say is the greatest scientists in the world, the biggest atheists in the world, they're making a big, big leap of faith by saying an entire universe can come from nothing. Can they demonstrate that something comes from nothing? No, they can't. They have to take it on faith. They used to believe the universe was eternal in the past. Eternal. Right? You know, that's, that's called the steady state model. And then it was Einstein, who was such an amazing genius, 
who sat at his desk and said, you know, I'm getting this expanding universe in my calculation, or contracting. So he added something called lambda, right? Cosmological constant, which guarantees that the universe has a steady state. And then later on we found out that he was actually right in his initial calculations. The universe is expanding because there's a redshift of the stars, microwave background radiation, all these types of things. So you can extrapolate backwards to a point of singularity. Right? So what is a Jogaro fault? What is the smallest possible piece of matter? What is it? So scientists say it's the light quantum. It's a photon. Light. Everything comes from light. Very interesting. The first words of God in the Torah is Yehi Or, Vahi Or. Let there be light. And there was light. There's a hadith of Jabba. The Prophet said to Jabba, don't you know the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever created was the light of your Prophet? And from that, all the rest of creation was extracted. It's very interesting. You know. Very, very interesting. Um... You know, so, you know, Daniel Dennett, one of the four horsemen of the new atheism, he said the universe came from nothing, for nothing, by nothing. If you want to believe in that type of religion, you can. That's a religion, right? Scientism or atheism, what do you call it? Creationism, whatever you want to call it. Scientism, I guess they call it. For nothing, by, for nothing from nothing, by nothing, you know. So the point of revelation, then, I mean, there's something. To, there may be a verse in the Quran that indicates the Big Bang theory. I want to get a little bit of the end of the Quran. What is it? Not Quran. Taqnahuma. Right. Some of the Quran. Maurice Bukhari, for example, he says uh, the, the translation is, "Don't the unbelievers see the heavens and the earth was one unit of matter, and then we clove them asunder. We clove them asunder. Right." But primarily the purpose of Revelation is to tell you why, not how or what. Why? Right? So a scientist can say what? Right? And when? 13.72, 5 C billion years, initial point of singularity, you have pump time quantum mechanics, and you have an expanding universe, you get all, all this scientific jargon. But why? You know? Allah says why. Well, we did not create jinn and human beings except to worship. Illa liya'budun. Ibn Abbas says, Illa liya'budun means, Illa liya'rifun. We did not create human beings in, in ins, you know, jinn and ins, except to worship. Ibn Abbas, Mufassir al-Quran, he says, that you can't really worship Allah unless you know Allah. So then the purpose is to know Allah. But then you, but then he says, if you knew Allah, you would love Allah. So then the purpose is just to love Allah. That's the purpose of creation. To love Allah. By worshipping Him with knowledge. But you can't get that from, you know, Stephen Hawking or who was this other guy? Who was the guy in Oxford? Richard Dawkins. Oh, <laughs> Richard Dawkins, yeah. You know, um, what is it? Roger Penrose, the other cosmologist. Roger Penrose, yeah. What's the uh, what's his degree in Richard Dawkins? Biology. Man, biology. A biologist engaging in a theological debate. Right. It's very strange. These people have never studied theology. You know. <clears throat> so it's like the analogy my teachers use is like uh, you have a you have a painting like the Mona Lisa, and you take a scientist and you say analyze this, and the and a scientist will go up to it, he'll take a sample from the paint. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll do a carbon dating on the canvas, you know, give you all this information. You know, this paper is from Florence in the 15th century, and the paint is acrylic, and it's from here, and all of, all of this information. All this information, right? And they put a child in front of it, and you say, what is this? And the child says, why is she smiling? Why? What does it mean? So who is closer which one of these two people is closer to the mind of the author, of the, of the artist, if it she is the child? Because he's asking the better question, the more uh, transcendental question of why, not what. What is there? Great. But why? That's revelation compared to science. 
and they're not at odds. Yes, sir. Is there any specific reading or prayers that are beneficial? You know, you feel that that's all that. You got to read this, 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 six this during the night. Not that I'm aware of, no. Not that I'm aware of. Um, the the ulama say that that every mu'min can go on a mi'raj. And that's the salah, that's the prayer. You can't go physically. So there's, there's two things that that a saint, a wali, we believe in awliya, right, saints. There's two things that a wali cannot do that a prophet can. Because a wali can perform miracles, or al-karamat. They're different than mu'jizat, which are prophetic miracles. So a wali cannot receive revelation, tanzil, right? Because revelation, the door is closed. And also he cannot make a physical miraj. But the ruh can make the miraj. There's even a hadith, it's attributed to the Prophet I said, Allah I don't know the strength of its authenticity. That the prayer, as salat, as salatu mi'raj al-mu'min. That the prayer is the ascension of the woman, of the believer. You can pray for that. You know, so some of these, you know, some of the ulama, when they go into prayer, they're not here, and time draws out. You know, like you're watching a good movie, like you're watching Titanic, right? <laughs> like four hours long. You're watching Avatar or something like that, and you're you're sitting there and you're loving it, and then you go, "Whoa, it's been three hours. It's gone because you're so immersed. You lost time, right? That's how some people are in their prayer." That just it, it's gone because they're not they're not really there, you know. There's a companion named Abad bin Bishop, uh, and uh, he was praying at one of the Bedouin tribes from Bani Ghatafan. Um, he saw him praying, and he started firing arrows at him. And Abad bin Bishop kept plucking them out of his body and praying. And then at the end of the prayer, he fell, right? Because he's in. He understands that he's in prayer. Right? There's another companion who had a compound fracture in his leg, and the bone is sticking out. You can't set it at that time to cut off the leg. So they tried to amputate, and he went, ah! So he said, help me to my good foot. They pick him up, and he says, oh, oh, oh. And they cut his leg off. Didn't make a sound. Because <laughs> he's in prayer. One of my teachers who studied in Syria, he told me the story. He said he was in the front row of the, you know, the masjid, and um, during the prayer, a tank came into the mosque. A tank. Imagine how loud that is. Everyone scattered except the imam who was standing there. He didn't even budge. And then he said, did you know a tank came into the mosque? He said, yeah, what? Really? He looked around, what? How did that get here? Is there any? So that's what we should pray for. That's a good thing to pray. Focus in the prayer. You know. Focus in the prayer is very important. I think we'll stop at this point. Thank you for coming. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our understanding and our knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our love of Allah the Messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us a tawfiq to implement our prayer on a daily basis to help our families implement their prayer, our women and children and husbands. If they're not praying, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them the tawfiq by means of our dua to help them implement the prayer and to keep the prayer going and also to give us focus in the prayer, the focus of the sahaba, the focus of, of the awliya and anbiya.